Good morning, church family, and those of you who are watching across the internet, we're glad that you could join us for today's message, which is entitled, Who Do You Say Jesus Is? Who do you say Jesus is? And our main text is in Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 20. Luke 9, 18 through 20. Now, answering and asking questions is an important part of learning. We ask questions to learn more information about something. And we answer questions to provide more information. Believe it or not, some questions are easier to ask and answer than others. And some questions and their corresponding answers are more important than others. In today's text, Jesus asks his disciples two questions. And while one question is important, it is the answer to the second question that is the most meaningful. The question is not only for the disciples of Jesus' day, but for each one of us today. And this question involves everything about our lives, our passions, desires, hopes, our past, present, and future. And how we answer this question will direct our Christian lives. It will determine whether we tell others about Jesus or not. How much time we spend in real, meaningful prayer to God. Whether or not we spend time in God's Word. And how much we're blessed by Him. And it will ultimately determine whether people will turn to or away from God. We will not only answer this question verbally, we will answer it with our actions. So let me ask you, how will you answer that question at school, at work, at home, at the ball game, or the store, or at the restaurant? How do you answer that question when someone accuses you of something false? And the question that we must answer is, who do we say Jesus is? What we believe about Jesus, who we say he is, will determine whether or not we have a meaningful relationship with him. So before we get into God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your son Jesus and his death and resurrection that provides for us the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life with you. Father, we thank you for your word, which we are about to study this morning. I pray that you would be with me, that as I preach it, that you would help me to communicate it clearly and effectively as I should. And I pray that we would be able to live our lives for you. And that we would be able to profess our faith in Jesus Christ, not only by our words, but even by our actions, our conduct, and the decisions that we make each and every day. Father, I pray that that we would take this question seriously and that we would answer that question and it would impact our lives for the better. Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 20. Luke 9, 18 through 20. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Once when Jesus was praying privately and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ 
of God. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the events of this private interaction between Jesus and his disciples. And at this point in the gospel, Jesus and the disciples are near Caesarea Philippi. It's a city that's located north of Galilee and and just southwest on the base of Mount Hermon, which has traditionally been thought to be the Mount of Transfiguration, which we will be studying in another uh, upcoming message. And Caesarea Philippi was inhabited by Gentiles, and it was named in honor of Caesar Augustus and also of Philip the Tetrarch, who was one of the sons of King Herod the Great. Well, the town, the city of Caesarea Philippi, was Roman in conduct, and it was very paganist. And one of the main attractions was springs and shrines that were dedicated to the Greek god Pan. But this area has had a history of Baal worship. And so there has been all kinds of satanic and paganistic worship that has taken place in this vicinity for many centuries. And so this is one reason why the Jews did not like to go anywhere near Caesarea Philippi. Well, we see in the text today that Jesus is praying privately, but that the disciples are with him. Now, he's probably within talking distance from them as he's praying, while they may be talking amongst themselves, maybe about how Jesus was able to feed over 5,000 people with just five small loaves of bread and two small fish. Or maybe they remain quiet while Jesus was praying. Luke doesn't really fill in very much details about this. But when Jesus finishes praying, either when he had completely finished or the disciples had some way interrupted him, he asked the disciples the first of two questions. It's really the first of three questions, but the last two form one question. And so he asked the first of two questions. Who do the crowds say I am? Now, Jesus didn't ask this question because he didn't know the answer and he wanted to find out the information from the disciples. No, he already knew the answer. He asked the question because he would use this question to introduce a more important follow-up question. But the disciples began to answer Jesus' first question by telling them what they had heard a lot of the people in the crowds uh, say in regards to Jesus. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Now this may sound familiar to us who have been studying uh, the Gospel of Luke because Just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Herod Antipas and how he was wanting to know more about this Jesus that he was hearing things about. And this was what the people, the crowds were telling Herod. He's John the Baptist, come back to life. He's one of the prophets. He's Elijah. And so this was a very widely held belief or set of beliefs that the people had concerning Jesus. But people who thought that Jesus was John the Baptist didn't really know him well because he and John ministered at the same time. In fact, John had baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. And so they were there together at the same time. So he couldn't be John the Baptist. Now, both John and Elijah, as prophets of God, were essentially national reformers who stood against the corrupt leaders and rulers of their day. And the similarity with the courage and the righteousness of Jesus may have suggested 
the connection. Perhaps in seeing Jesus in John or Elijah, the people hoped for a political Messiah, one who would overthrow the corrupt Romans that oppressed Israel. Well, the Jewish people have been waiting for centuries for the promised Messiah to appear. But they had mistaken the identity of the Messiah. They looked for a worldly, military, or political leader who would free them from Rome and restore their nation back to the good old days under King David. Now, there were a lot of rumors as to who Jesus was, but they didn't really know him for sure. Well, the Christian faith goes beyond knowing what others believe. It requires us to hold beliefs for ourselves. No one can be saved by what others believe. Only Jesus can save a person. Your husband or your wife can't save you. Your parent or your child cannot save you. I cannot save you. Only by placing your faith and trust in Jesus and obeying his commands can you be saved by his grace and mercy. Now, these people that I just mentioned, they can have a profound spiritual influence in your life. But you have to know who Jesus is in your understanding and not someone else's. And as we consider the state of man and his relationship to God in light of the word of God, salvation is indeed a personal matter. But it is not, nor was it ever meant to be private but publicly shared and declared. And this is why Jesus asked the follow-up question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? You see, it was fine for the disciples to know what the crowds thought about Jesus. But Jesus had to ask them as individuals what they believed about Jesus. Now, Jesus knew that the disciples would have a different opinion of him than the crowds. You see, they didn't just receive the conventional wisdom or the popular opinion of the day. They should know who Jesus was. And this is the question that is placed before all who will hear about Jesus. And it is we who will be judged on how we answer that question. And we answer this question every day by what we believe and do. If we truly believe Jesus is who he says he is, it will truly affect the way we live. See, it determines whether or not we have a meaningful relationship with him. Now, Peter knew Jesus better than the crowds did. He knew that Jesus is the Christ of God, God's Messiah, the promised Redeemer of the Old Testament, the Messiah from the heart of God, not the Messiah from the desires of men. Well, the disciples had a great advantage over the crowds because they had spent 24-7 with Jesus for about 18 months. They have had intimate conversations and personal interactions with Jesus that none of the crowds had the opportunity to experience. They witnessed that what Jesus preached, he lived out daily. They saw the power and authority of Jesus over every power imaginable. Sickness, death, demons, nature, and the list goes on. They witnessed his compassion for those who were suffering, not only physically, but spiritually, and how he ministered to them. Well, I want us to turn to the Gospel of Matthew for a moment. 
and see this from Matthew's viewpoint. In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man is a messianic title. And Jesus used this title in reference to himself more than any other title. And so he was declaring that he was the Messiah in his, in his own way by saying, the Son of Man. So he's asking them, who do the people say I am? Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man or by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? Because even though they were his disciples and they believed in him, believing is not enough. They must also confess him. Notice that Jesus didn't ask, who do the crowds believe I am? He asked, who do the crowds say I am? Both belief and confession are necessary. Now, being that the disciples knew Jesus better than anyone, they should be able to confess their faith and give a reason for the hope that is within them. And they should have no doubts at this point and be ready to declare what they know and believe about him. And so Simon Peter boldly speaks up and declares, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is very pleased with Peter's confession. Peter declared Jesus to be the Messiah, but he also identified him as the Son of God, to be divine, to be God. Now, Peter didn't come to this understanding on his own. Nor was it through anyone else, but God the Father revealed the truth about Jesus to him. Jesus stated that he would build his church upon the rock, the bedrock foundation of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. His church will be built upon Jesus himself and everything hinges upon him. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, it prophesied that Jesus would be the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, that he would be the rock upon which it was built. We know Jesus to be the Savior, the judge, the advocate, the creator. But he is also a stumbling stone and a rock of offense for those who do not believe. Psalm 118, verse 22, prophesied that. Isaiah 8, verse 14, also prophesies that. And Peter quoted that in, when he wrote 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. See, Jesus is the rock of our salvation, and he is the basis of our entire faith. And the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Hebrews 12, verse 2, says, 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or the beginning and the end, the originator and the completer of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, those who have looked to him have found refuge in eternal life in him. However, to those who reject him, he is a stumbling stone in their way. Meaning that they are so self-absorbed in their self-righteousness that they never notice God's salvation right in front of them, providing the way. And so Jesus is placed directly in our paths. And to those who rely on themselves, they find him in the way. But to those who trust him, they find he is the way and the truth and the life, according to John 14, verse 6. Let me ask you, do you believe and confess Jesus to be these things? Or do you believe and confess Jesus to be what the world says that he is? And some people say that Jesus was just a good teacher, that he was just a prophet, that he was just a human. Some even say that he was a sinner. Some believe that he didn't even exist. He was just a religious symbol. Who do you say Jesus is? And how we answer this question determines whether we have a meaningful relationship with him or not. Well, I want you to notice that after Peter made this great confession of who Jesus is, and after Jesus commends him for this, Jesus states that he will suffer and die and be on the third day raised again. And so Peter takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him by saying, Never, Lord, this will never happen to you. Now it was one thing for Peter to make a statement of faith at the moment. But when life sets in and trials and conflicts occur, his actions do not match his confession. And it's so easy for us to gather here today and say, yes, I believe in Jesus. He is my Savior and Lord. He is Christ, the Son of the living God. But then our actions throughout the week say the opposite. Look at what Jesus says to Peter after Peter had rebuked Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus told him that he was standing in the way of what had to happen according to God's will. The Messiah must suffer and die, and be raised on the third day. You see, if Jesus had not suffered and died, Peter and us would have died in our sins and been forever separated from God. Peter tried to evaluate the situation from a human perspective rather than from God's perspective. And Satan was working through Peter to try to dissuade Jesus to fulfill his purpose and mission. And Satan often tempts us, trying to get us to leave God out of the picture. And Jesus rebuked Peter for that attitude. You see, it's one thing to profess faith in Jesus, but it's another thing to live that profession of faith through our daily actions, conduct, 
and decisions. Well, Luke ends this text with Jesus telling his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. Now, that may seem strange to us, and we think, why wouldn't Jesus want them to tell the people who he was? They would accept him and, and, and embrace him as the Messiah. Well, Jesus didn't want them to reveal that he was the Christ until after his resurrection. You see, the greatest proof of Jesus being the Messiah is his resurrection. And he didn't want them proclaiming who he was until they had that proof. If they would have been convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, they never would have crucified him. And we would have all died in our sins. And the good news is that Jesus is building his church of people who would believe and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who would preach the gospel and live the gospel and be assured that the world, the flesh, and the devil would never prevail against the power and the purpose which is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ himself. Let me ask you, are you part of that church that Jesus is building? Who do you say Jesus is? I implore you not to ignore or to put off this question, but to answer it honestly. Who do you say Jesus is? If you can answer like Peter and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, would you place your faith and trust in Jesus? Repenting of your sins, confessing Him to be your Savior and Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and receive the indwelling gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit, who will reveal the truth of who Jesus is and helps you to live out that profession of faith daily as you obey His Word in faith. If you're ready to make that decision today, will you make it? And if you made it, would you use the information at the end of this video or down in the description below to get in contact with me and to let me know about your decision? I would love to hear about it and to help you follow up upon it. I pray that this week, as you consider the question, who is Jesus and who do you say he is, that you would come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that how you answer that question will determine whether you truly have a meaningful relationship with him or not. I pray that you would have a good week, and God bless.